Okay, so um, last time we, we sort of changed our point of view if we move from the Lagrangian uh, to the Hamiltonian, okay? So let me remind you the Hamiltonian H or some, sometimes people, it's a function of your generalized coordinates and the generalized momenta and then maybe time. So you see that we, we move from a picture in which we have the coordinates, the generalized coordinates, and then the velocities were sort of uh, derived quantities, okay? And we live in what is called the configuration space to a new point of view in which we really consider QI and PI as independent coordinates, okay? So your space is twice as big. It's called the phase space where you have generalized coordinates and generalized momenta. And in fact, the, the, the relationship between your generalized coordinates and your momenta, remember, comes from the Hamilton uh, equations that I, I, I write for you again. Okay, so by right, you, you have the, 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 the QI dot is equal, so I guess if I write the Hamiltonian this way, and then you have minus PDI uh, dot. And in case you, you, you have an explicit time dependence, well, maybe I should stick to, you also have that. So these are called the canonical or Hamilton's canonical equation of motion. And uh, remember that, you see, you increase the number because these are two times n, if n is the number of degrees of freedom. So you increase by two, you multiply by two the number of equations, you have twice as many uh, uh, variables, qi and pi, okay, these are function of, of t, so your trajectory is the q of t and then the p of t, now in phase space, and you gain that instead of having second order differential equations, you have a system of first order differential equations. So it's a trade-in, uh, as we said. I mean, uh, it's not that you, you trade in some uh, difficulties and uh, you gain something. So you gain the fact that the differential equations are one order lower, uh, but you have uh, twice as many. So, well, it's up to. But certainly this is a powerful uh, point of view uh, that has been used very much, and in fact it is the starting point of most of... Uh, Hi. Most of, uh, of, uh, of, 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 of the physics that you are going to study, for, for instance, quantum mechanics, you start from the Hamiltonian, uh, and it's the same Hamiltonian. The only difference is that uh, your, your Q's and your P's are operators, so are a little more complicated. They are, they are matrices. Uh, you may wonder if you, ca can you derive this from a variation? You remember that we derived the Lagrangian, the Lagrange equations from a variational principle. Do you remember that? That, that was this nice thing that uh, if, you, if you vary this quantity, right, the integral of the Lagrangian over time, the, 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 the actual trajectories of motion of your systems were those for which this variation was stationary. You remember this, right? By requiring this, you, 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 you re-derive or you rediscover uh, uh, Lagrange uh, equations, okay? That was very beautiful, very elegant, and uh, uh, because uh, it was the fact that uh, uh, among all the possible, possible paths that uh, a, a system can take from time T1 and T2, the actual path taken is the one that uh, makes this uh, integral that is called the action uh, uh, stationary, so an extreme, usually the minimum or the maximum, okay? You remember that or were you, did you find it interesting or moderately, okay? Well, it's, you see, it's a completely alternative 
way of describing, instead of saying this point goes from here to there because f is equal to ma, you say it goes from there to there in such a way to maximize or minimize this quantity, okay? So it's, uh, well. So uh, how about the Hamiltonian, or better, the Hamilton's uh, equations of motion? Can they derive from something similar? Certainly, yes. After all, they, they, there is the same amount of information you have here uh, is the same that you had uh, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of the Lagrangian. And in fact, if I replace the Lagrangian by, you remember this uh, uh, Legendre transformation, I can rewrite this uh, variational principle from these two uh, times, so T1 and T2. So uh, uh, L, uh, you remember, uh, is just P Q dot I sum, Einstein, Einstein sum, minus the Hamiltonian that itself is a function of, of this. So if I rewrite this, I just rewrite the Lagrangian, is identical, this is the Lagrangian. So I just replace the Lagrangian uh, uh, with the, with the Le, Le, Legendre transformation uh, that usually we wrote as H equal this minus the Lagrangian, but I certainly can move my, the, my terms from one side to the other. And I do my variation, right, that is the variation of, uh, uh, along all possible paths with the constraint that I keep the two end points, T1 and T2, fixed. Okay, if I do that, uh, you understand that uh, uh, you get the same, uh, so, I mean, this is the Lagrangian, so uh, let me call it F, this quantity, uh, uh, now, and... Uh, you see, the only difference here is that uh, I'm doing my variation not only under the generalized coordinates, but also the generalized momenta, right? So I have uh, two sets of, uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, Lagrange equation. One for this, right? And the other, when, when here, I have the P's. So I'm just redoing what we did uh, several weeks ago. I, I know that the, the, the condition for this variation to vanish, meaning that this is a, station, a stationary point, is, is, the, 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 is exactly the Lagrange equations. And the only thing I have to remember here is that uh, now I'm doing the variation not in the configuration space, but in the phase space, because I have Q, Q's and P's as independent variables. Therefore, uh, I have uh, twice as many Lagrange equations. I have the one with respect to the Q dots and the Q's and the P dot and the P's, okay? But uh, you see that uh, if you look at this, so F is this quantity. You see, uh, 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 what is this DF, DQ dot, uh, right? The Q dot, you see that uh, is just the, the PI, right? So this term, this term, this term here is just, the, is just the PI. So if I take the, well, it's just the P, P, uh, uh, P, P I guess PJ, but uh, PJ. And what is this? You see that the only dependence on the QIs is in, in the Hamiltonian, so this, it's just the dh dqj. How about this term? What, it, there is no dependence on the p dots, right? Because this there will be the acceleration. In general, you don't have a dependent. So this is just not there. And, and this one has two terms, right? This one, it has this term and this term. So this one, this equation here, leads directly to, to the first of these, because you see this is q dot from here, q dot uh, uh, j now, right? Q dot uh, j minus d h d uh, p j must vanish. You see this is exactly 
this. Uh, and this one here, so this, you see this, this is pj, so you have p, p dot j minus dh uh, uh, actually there is a minus here right so it becomes a plus uh, dqj equal to zero that I guess is this one here so indeed from the same variational principle and therefore, from the same point of view, I can derive now the same way I derived the, the, the Lagrange equations. And actually, I'm just using the, the previous results. I, I do rec regain my Hamilton's uh, set of equations. So the canonical equations can be derived from a variational principle uh, uh, as well as the, uh, yeah, as the, the other. In fact, here there, 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 is a, there are many variations that you can apply to this, uh, to this or other quantities. And uh, OK, we don't have time to discuss that. But if you go to your textbook, the Goldsteins, you will see that there is also a thing that is called the principle of least action. That is the traditional way of uh, discussing these, uh, uh, these, these variational problems uh, leading to dynamical equations. So if you, if you like the, the subject, you can go and read about it. It's it just a more general variation of the action. And you derive something similar. So OK, well, it would be nice to discuss. But. So uh, beside that, what I want to now uh, do is uh, I want to solve the, these equations, OK? And uh, but so on Friday we have a problem solved, right? Um, uh, so how was the test? It was interesting. Uh, you have already enough problems, right? Or you want more for Friday? OK, but uh, that, so then on Friday, uh, maybe I'll give you some extra problems that we, d we won't solve together, because otherwise you haven't solved any problems on the Hamiltonians. But uh, certainly, uh, usually the final test is uh, like three problems or four, and uh, one of them is on the Hamiltonian. I mean, OK, uh, I forgot if it's four or three. Uh, we, we see. Did you decide when to, when to have this? You, you haven't decided yet? Did you or did you not? OK, but try to converge on some date. <laughs> uh, OK, so uh, so let's, uh, uh, so we have our canonical equations. And uh, so I don't want to, uh, I'll give you some problems that you can try and solve, uh, some specific problems. But here, I don't want to discuss some uh, particular uh, problem that we can solve. I mean, all problems that you have solved using the Lagrangian, clearly you can solve them. Uh, you, I, show, I show you like the pendulum and some other stuff. But uh, by looking at these equations, uh, you can uh, 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 see that uh, there is a, a systematic way to try and solve these equations. And the, the, uh, the um, the, the way it, it was already hinted by what I said last time, right? Because uh, remember that if you have uh, uh, if you have a cyclic variables, right, like you had in the Lagrangian, meaning that the, the variables does not appear. So you take one of the Q's here, and your Hamiltonian does not depend on these variables, right? That, that's the definition of a cyclic. OK, that was uh, nice uh, and it was useful within the Lagrangian approach. But here, is, I said, is even more powerful because if you have this property, immediately one, the corresponding momentum, because by assumption this goes to 0, it vanishes. So from this equation, I, I obtained the fact that the corresponding conjugate momentum of these two canonical variables is conserved, right? 
And this was true, obviously, also in the Lagrangian context through the Noether theorem. But here, it's, in a way, it's even more powerful because now the momenta are themselves variables. So that means if you have a cyclic variables, it's like a, a double, you know, you pay one, you get two, because uh, not only it does not depend on the QI, but the corresponding momenta is also a constant. So what would be the ideal situation? Well, the ideal situation is that if you have all cyclic variables, because you understand that then the Hamiltonian is just a constant, because it's a function of constant, and a function of constant is a constant, right? So how nice would that be, right? If, if for each problem you were able to change your variables in such a way that they were all cyclic and all the momenta constants, because that means what? Let, let me call, so if, 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 if you, if a variable qi is cyclic, the pi is constant, and I call it alpha i. Usually, alpha is a constant, but not always, but in this context. So if, if is this the situation, so I, I say the ideal situation, right, would be all q sub i's are, are cyclic, cyclical variables, meaning that they are not there, OK? Then I said the Hamiltonian is just a constant, right? Because you have all the PIs are just alpha i. And then the Hamiltonian is a fun so it's not a function of the QIs, because by, by assumption, I'm assuming that it's not, because otherwise they would not be cyclic. And therefore, this is alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha n, right? These are all constants. This is a constant. What happened to the Hamilton, Hamilton uh, equations of motion? Well, they become very simple, right? Because one is this, the, th the things that this is a constant. And the other one, you see, this is a constant. So it's just a derivative of this constant. So it's just the QI. It's just dH d alpha uh, i. That can only be a constant that I call omega i. So it's a constant in time. This is really the, the, the best of all possible words. Because this is so this is a, a, a this is a trivial equation, and this is too, is as trivial as that, because this is not you know, you can integrate immediately. Qi as a function of t is just omega i t plus maybe some uh, some integration constant that is another constant that I call beta. So you have solved the problem. If this is the situation, I call it ideal because immediately you can integrate uh, uh, your uh, uh, you can immediately integrate your the p is p, so p i of t is a constant. So those are your trajectory in phase space. The p stays whatever is the initial value, alpha. And the qi's are just a linear function of time with these two constants. So what I'm saying is that if this is the case, then uh, you, you don't need uh, elliptic integrals. You don't need any. <laughs> you don't have to, to read that book uh, that I'm pushing every day, <laughs> trying to sell it. Uh, you don't have to need mathematics. Uh, you can, uh, you know, any four years old can, can solve. Well, maybe not the four years old, but uh, any t teenagers can uh, solve that uh, set of equations. OK? So that would be great. Uh, uh, I, we have a question. OK, uh, uh, yeah, I'm assuming also that uh, energy is conserved. I'm, so I'm assuming that also t, you see, I'm saying all cyclic variables. So I'm assuming that also t is cyclic so that, uh, yeah. Otherwise, you have a time dependence there. But OK, so this is nice. Uh, it's really exciting in a way. But uh, uh, so practically, what can I do? Well, clearly, uh, very few systems can, uh, I mean, for very few systems, you can do that. But uh, 
for any system, you can try to do a change of variables because you see, you understand that the number of cyclic variables depend on the choice of, of coordinates, right? Remember that the, the, the trivial example is a spherical symmetrical system that you describe using Cartesian coordinates. You don't have any cyclic variables, right? Uh, because, however, if you go to spherical coordinates, immediately you find a lot of cyclic variables, right? You see, so your choice of, uh, th this was where we started from. The, the, both the Lagrangian and the Hamiltonians are very powerful tools, but you st so that once you, you write them down, then uh, you, know, you have a protocol that you follow and you, uh, you end up with your solution. But the catch is, or if you want, the, the complication is conserved after all, because you must be clever in choosing your generalized coordinates. And here is even more true. Here you have to be clever because the more clever you are, the more cyclic variables you, you have. And ideally, if you are so smart to make all your variables cyclic, then you are done. Like, uh, you know, five minutes after I give you the problems, you walk out. Right, ideally. <laughs> so can we, ha so the question, you see, I I instead of solving differential equations, now you have to try to find these coordinates and you have to rely, relay, sorry, on the, uh, so what kind of change of variables y are you allowed? This is the question, okay? Actually, it's a very large set uh, of transformation. And so I, I want now to talk about what kind of change of variables you, you, can, you can perform and which one you can. And uh, so, I, so I, I want to change from an original set of variables that I call little q's and little p's to a new set that I call big Q. So these are transformations. So let, let's assume that big Q is a function of your orig original set of variables, maybe even time. So here I should put uh, some, some index, but uh, and new p, big pi is a function of your original Q, p, and t. Okay, so this is just the definition of a, of a transformation. So just a change of variable. For instance, I want to, I decide that all my coordinates become momenta, and all my momenta become coordinates. That's perfectly allowed. I switch them over. Or, uh, you know, the Q's become a sine of P, and, you know, very general. They are very, a very general transformations, and these transformations are called canonical. Everything here is called canonical. And so those are the canonical equations, and th these are the canonical transformations. And the only condition that you have for a transformation of coordinates to be canonical is that uh, at the end of the transformation, it e exists a function that you call k such that, such as, you can write your equations as Hamilton equations, right? In the, new, in the new variables, obviously. So this, I guess, is a capital K. I don't know how to. Everything is capital in the new. So this is the definition of a canonical transformation. So it's a very large uh, set of transformations but it's not all possible transformations. There are transformations that are canonical and others that are not. And you are allowed to use only canonical transformations in order to hunt for cyclic uh, variables. And you understand that this is condition is that the one that guarantees you that in the new variables, still the uh, Hamilton's equations uh, hold, right? You don't want to do a transformation that ends up uh, with not having the same dynamical equations, okay? So that's the condition is exactly that. But this is a very large, as you will see, we will, we will discuss some, some uh, possible transformations.
So actually, how do I go about, so this you understand. So let's start again from the left side. So uh, if you, so uh, you will see, I mean, there is a, a, a standard way to characterize these canonical transformations. And it comes from the fact that, you see, if you, if you look at the, this definition of big K and big H that I remove, you remember they, they, they came from this variation, variational principle, right, that uh, I rewrite here. If you had your original uh, P i q dot i minus uh, the Hamiltonian, right? And if this is true, then uh, now you have uh, the same for the big guys. So big capital P, uh, uppercase P, uppercase Qs minus this K that is the new Hamiltonian in the new uh, capital uh, uppercase uh, uh, canonical coordinates. But you see, if these two must hold at the same time, that means that uh, uh, these two integrands can, I mean, these two, they can only differ almost for a, a, a total derivative with respect to, to time, meaning that this is equal to this, except for a total derivative of a function that I don't know, an arbitrary function, uh, I mean the, the total derivative of, of, it, of an arbitrary function. Uh, this may be obvious or not. Uh, it's an exercise in your textbook to prove that this is true. So probably I didn't assign it because uh, we didn't have time. But uh, uh, just take it for, for or either you, pr you convince yourself doing the exercise or just take my word for that. So what I'm saying that this is equal to this, this function here is equal to this function except for a total derivative of a function, okay? This comes from the, you can convince yourself by, by going through uh, this. Uh, actually, this is the same reason why uh, two Lagrangians, two Lagrangians uh, uh, differing only for a total derivative of a function, they lead to the same equations of motion, okay? This, the, I think this is, was the exercise that I should have asked you to solve, but okay. And uh, actually, this is quite useful in certain situations if you go back now to the Lagrangian approach because uh, you understand that that may help in uh, shifting the value of the Lagrangian and or maybe if you, if you write a Lagrangian and you identify a sub piece of that Lagrangian, to be a total derivative of a function, then you can drop that part and you will have the same equations of motion. So that may be uh, useful. Okay, but then you understand that uh, if you know this function here, you know the transformation because these two differ only because of this function. So this change of variables is characterized exactly by this function that is the difference between these two sets. So in other words, if I know f, okay, I know the transformation. The transformation meaning this, the canonical transformation, okay? And what is the f? f must be a function of the old and the new variables, okay, because it's linking these two and it's completely characterizing the transformation. So it must be a mixed, a mixture of, of, of what? Can be either a little q and a big Q, sorry, and of course T, or can be so you have four possibilities, right? Can be little q and big Q, or little q and big P, or uh, a little P a big Q or 
little p and big P. So you have four possibilities, and usually in the literature they are called F1, F2, F3, F4. And you see that if, so you have these four possibilities, then, uh, as I said, by definition you have the pi qi dot minus h is equal to big pi big qi dot minus k plus this total derivative of f of t. So what I'm saying is now by this requirement that is built in in this definition, if I specify which, which f uh, I, I have there, I can uh, force this to be true and find differential equations through which I can find my f. And if I have f, I generate the canonical transformation. So this is the set of equations that you are supposed to study not to find the equations of motion of your system, but to find the canonical transformation. So that's useful because we are looking for canonical transformations that bring my system into that nice form in which most of the coordinates are cyclic. So for, for instance, let's look at the case in which I have the F1 function. You see that this is the total derivative with respect to F, and F1 is a function of little q, q big Q, and T, right? So what is this... Uh, what is this total derivative? Well, it's the usual story. I can always write the total derivative of a function as the sum of the partial derivatives, right? Of, of, so it depends on q. So I, this is a 1. This is a i. I know. Uh, q dot i plus df1 d big q i big q i dot plus maybe df1 dt, right? This is always true. I assume this from day one, so don't tell me please now that is day, last day minus three, <laughs> that uh, you don't understand that because otherwise I leave. <laughs> so this is always true. So now I can look and, and try to see what equations this F1 must satisfy in order for this to be true, right? And you see immediately, you see, you see this is H, this is A. Here you have Q dot, big Q, and here you have little Q dot, okay? So you see this coefficient must match. So that means that this PI pi must be equal to what? P right? And this big, this big pi must be equal to the other guy. Actually, with the minus sign, right? Because it's on the other side. And then whatever is left must be equal to this. So if I do that, you see I get three equations. I get that pi must be df1 dqi, then uh, the big pi, capital, uppercase, whatever, minus df1 dqi, and finally, whatever is left, that is h, k, and the, the derivative, uh, the partial derivative with respect to the time of the function f1, so that means the k is equal to h plus df1 dt. So you see, I have n equations that if I solve them, I get the, the, the big qi's as a function of little qi's and little pi's, okay? And the same for the big... Uh, so by solving these equations, I get exactly my canonical transformation, okay? So this, this is the trade-in. Instead of looking for the equation of motion, now I look for these new equations, I solve them by find, finding this uh, function f. By the way, these are called generating functions. If 
for obvious reasons, right, generating functions, because they generate the canonical transformation. And of course, the specific forms of these equations depend, you see, it depends on which function you have. So this set is, is OK for the generative function that I call f1. How about f2? Well, you just go through the same steps, but now with f2. Remember, f2 is a function of little q and big P. So instead of having this, here you have big P, big P, right? And then you have to compare. And you find the new equations. Or what is another possibility? The Legendre transformation. You, want, you see, you go from f1 to f2 by exchanging these two variables. So if you remember your Legendre transformation, f2 must be what? So, uh, well, actually, well, it depends on the sign. F1 is equal to F. So F2 is F1 plus the variables that you are switching. So F1 is F2 minus the variables that you are switching. And it, then you plug in, in there this, and you get the new equations. OK? And the new equations, let me write them for you, is PI is equal to F2. Uh, QI, and now you don't have the big PI, you have the big QI that is equal to plus uh, F2 little PI. Uh, no, big PI. There are. And this is still true. Okay? So if you go to your textbook again, you find the, the, the same for F3 and F4, and you get all four sets. So you should uh, bear in mind those uh, different uh, equations. Uh, what, what, let's just study some uh, simple examples of this canonical transformation so that uh, you get uh, some feelings for how they work. Let's take uh, the simplest example, for, in, for instance, uh, where well, I should have kept these uh, equations, but OK. Take a, a generating function that, uh, of, the ki of the kind F2 that is the simplest, just the product and the sum of uh, QI big PI. Now, remember the F2, I said that PI is equal for F2, DF2, DQ1, big QI is DPI, and the Hamiltonian is just, right? So usually here students ask, well, should I memorize all these equations, right? That's a reasonable question. Uh, OK, the answer is no, because if I ask you that, I'll give you the, the equations in the problem. Okay, But of course, you are welcome to memorize these four sets. You need to memorize four sets of equations. This, this anyway, is for F2. Now, let, let, let's, uh, let, let, so for, if F2 is equal to that, what is PI? Big PI. Is the, what is big QI? No, no. And what is K? H. H. So this is, what, what, what transformation is this? Well, it's canonical. OK, very good. But I mean, I, I, little p goes in big P. It's an identity, right? So it's the simplest transformation. I, I just changed the name from lower case to upper case. So this is the, well, OK. No, no, big, no big deal. 
But uh, what about if I take for F2 uh, 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 this one? Here I take uh, a generic uh, uh, a generic function of, of the QI, OK? And I multiply by big PI. So the identity is gone. Right, so I take F2 to be just any function of the little q's, okay, a, a, a different one for, and then I multiply by big P. So what is PI? PI is, uh, no, no, it's not zero. Huh? Yeah. So the most interesting is this one, right, because you see QI, this is this arbit, no, it's not zero. Is this arbitrary transformation? So this is an arbitrary transformation. So it's just a point transformation. So, okay, any point transformation, any point transformation of your coordinates, is a canonical transformation. That means no matter what kind of transformation you do, you take a, well, it's up to you. Any transformation, any point transformation of your coordinates, you know. To, to transform to the new ones is a canonical, so that's very good. You can really, uh, you can really, uh, well, you can really transform. <laughs> and how about last example, last trivial example at least. I take of the kind F1. So this is Q, so I take Q, K, lit, big, Q, so the product of the, of the, uh, well, this you already know in a way because you see it's like a, a Legendre transformation, but let's do it. Uh, so you see the, now I have the wrong equations, right? Because I want the, the one for the, for the F1. So that's why, uh, so it was little, uh, this was the same, right? Because, and this one is the, the one that is big, big PI. And here you have big Q, and this is this. So what is this transformation? Well, this goes into big uh, QI, right? <coughs> and this goes, goes uh, actually, there is a minus here, if I remember correctly. So here you get minus QI, and here is just the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonians remains the same. The Hamiltonians always remain the same unless you put an explicit time dependent here. And what the transformation is this? It's just, uh, as I said before, you can always trade in. You can always trade in your coordinates for the momenta and vice versa. So if one morning you decide that instead of using your coordinates, you want to use the momenta and vice versa, that's OK. It's a canonical transformation. You are guaranteed by this construction that this is going to be canonical. Yes? Which one? The one, the point, the point function, yeah. So this was uh, of the type F2, and I took any point transformation, right? So, but only of the coordinates. Actually, I took even time dependence, so you are going to have a shift in the Hamiltonian, but okay, let's uh, forget about this. A and I multiply this by, by the big PI. Then here you have two, here this is switched to the QI, I guess, uh, big PI. Okay, so here you are going to have some complicated function that is the derivative of this, right? So, okay, it's whatever it is. But uh, I'm interested in, in what happened to, to the big Q, the new coordinates. You see, they are simply whatever point transformation you had here because you take the derivative with respect to the big P and you are left with this. So this is a transformation of your coordinates that is arbitrary in a sense, is a point transformation. So any transformation you can think of, almost.
you know about point transformation, so the point that you, you just have x, then you take any function of this x, this is a point transformation. You take any function. It should be a well, reasonably well-behaved function, but in the real world all, world, all functions are reasonably well-behaved. I mean, you know, those pathological cases of functions you find only in the mathematical textbooks they live outside. They are useful to, to test theorem, but uh, then uh, the, the, the yeah, okay. And of course, you have to compensate somehow for this to be a canonical. So here you get actually something that is complicated because it's the derivative here of this function with respect to this times the dpi. So this may be complicated. But the point here is that it allows you to think at least in principle that any point transformation of your original coordinates is an allowed canonical transformation. <coughs> so it's a very powerful tool. And uh, should we look at, uh, 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 at some uh, uh, real life example? Yes, of course. So for instance, how about the harmonical oscillators? OK, I know that we already solved that. So by now, you have solved that problem using f equal to ma, I hope, not here, but somewhere else. We have solved it using the Lagrangian. We want to solve it using the Hamiltonian, right? But not by brute force, but by finding some interesting canonical transformations that makes this problem into a very simple one, OK? So let's do that. So first, we have to write the Hamiltonian. What is the Hamiltonian for an harmonical oscillator? So So how do I write an Hamiltonian? Right, for instance. So th therefore, what is the kinetic energy then? But I have to write, yeah? Right. Are you all on the same page? Or is that obvious? OK, very good. OK, how about the other term? OK. Or right, let's, let's do it uh, like this, for instance, first. If, if I have a spring with the spring constant k, OK, uh, should I say more? No. Then uh, let's, uh, let's write it uh, in, a, in a nice way. I guess the, the quantum mechanical way is to introduce this omega, right? Omega square is equal to k over m. So I pull out the mass. And here I get this famous factor m square omega square q square. Very good. This is the Hamiltonian for the harmonic. In a way, this is the most famous and most important Hamiltonian that you will ever see. Because we already discussed, because of the small oscillations, you see everything comes together. This is very important because any system in any potential when perturb you do a perturbation about a, a stable uh, position, it will behave as an harmonic oscillator, right? So many, many systems you can discuss. And in fact, most of, say, 70% of physics is about the harmonic oscillator in various different situation. situations. OK, so it, you can perfectly find, in fact, I encourage you to do it, just write the Hamilton's canonical equations for this system and you know plug in solve them and you get your own usual sol solution in terms of trigonometric function but since we just learned that uh, if you see here uh, uh, is there any canonical variable uh, cyclic variable well this is a one dimensional system and unfortunately q is there so q is not uh, 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 okay so but question can I find a new set of variables, big Q, big P, such that this guy has no dependence on big Q? If I do that, I'm very happy, right? Because the Hamiltonian become, becomes a constant, and I know how to solve uh, a problem. Uh, you know, it's, it's trivial. Uh, we just discussed it in that case. So how about this transformation? Well, I have to find a generating function right, 
to be sure that this is a canonical transformation that makes uh, uh, that uh, when I uh, when I uh, uh, that generate the canonical transformations such that this system becomes uh, a constant. In other words, okay. Actually, actually, you see that uh, uh, there is a sort when you write it in this form. So okay, now the question is how do I find this function? That, of course, is a difficult question. There is no easy way. You have to guess this function. So here is where, you know. <laughs> but you see, he, here you have a sort of a hint. Because you see, this is p squared plus something plus q squared. And by now, you should remember that if you have square plus square, if that something is a sign, and the other side is a cosine. If you get sine square plus cosine square, that's very good because that's one. It's a constant. So in a way, if you find a transformation such that p, little p, goes into some function of big P and big Qs, such that is, well, let's say, a sine of big Q, and this is the cosine of big, of big Q, and somehow you get rid of that constant, then you get one, maybe with some, and then you are done, right? OK, so here I come in, and I tell you that to take f1, so f, f generating function of the type f1, so it depends on little q and big q. And OK, it's a weird object, is this. But OK, why? Well, we are going to see why. What are the equation? That uh, so I only have one degree degree of freedom, so I only have one q and one p. And remember that little p is the partial derivative of this generative function. So this is the generative function with respect to little q, right? So okay, I, I, I give you the f1. So we do together the partial derivative. So what is the partial derivative? With respect to little q of this, well, this is trivial, right? Is m omega q, and this is whatever it is because I'm not. And, and what is big P, uppercase P, uh, is minus, remember, or if you don't remember, I tell you. It's a, right? So you have to take the derivative of the cotangent. So it's m omega q squared divided by 2. And I tell you that the derivative of the cotangent is 1 over the sine square, right? Minus, minus you're right. So that takes care of that minus there. And there is no time dependence, so I don't have to worry. The Hamiltonian is going to be just the Hamiltonian. So what I want is, you see, uh, now I'm looking to k. So k is just h. There is no partial derivative because there is not explicit time dependence here. So all I have to do is to write h in terms of these big q's and big p, and then I'm done. So let's try this. To do that, I, so p, little p, I already have it in this form. So I need little p and little q in terms of big P and, and big Q, OK? So you have to solve this. And if you do that, you find that little Q is the square root of 2 big P m omega sine of big Q. And little P is 2 big P m omega cosine of BQ as advertised. Because if I now take this and I plug it in here, you see that you get exactly omega big P. So you see now the Hamiltonian is what? The Hamiltonian is there is no dependence on big Q. So Q is a cyclic variable. Big Q is a cyclic variable. Therefore, big P is just a constant. The Hamiltonian is just a constant. 
And now to write and integrate the Hamilton equations is exactly something that you can do in one line. Because what is the, so this is actually to be careful with the notation. This is your new Hamiltonian that we agree to call big K. So what are the, so big Q dot is equal to the partial, these are the canonical equation of the, of, uh, the partial derivative of K with respect to P, right? And big P is just the minus the derivative of K with respect to BQ, but by construction, this is zero, and P is a constant. So I only have to integrate this, but this is really simple because the tot it's just the derivative of this is a constant, so this is just omega. And therefore, Q as a function of time is just omega times T plus whatever Q naught, or let's call it alpha, that is the, the initial at time equal to, to, to zero, what is the value of Q, right? The initial coordinate. This is the solution. You see, you, see, you have, and if you plug in back in here, what happened? P is a constant. What, what, what is this constant, P? It's just the energy, right, uh, except for this omega. Because the Hamiltonian is the energy, right? So this is the energy. So P is the energy divided by omega. So I can rewrite this as the square root of twice. P, we said, is the energy divided by omega. So it's this. Sine, what is big Q, is this. Omega t plus the initial, the initial value. And this, you see, is the nice old friend, the sign that is the solution of this problem. You see, I, I found the solution with no, no fancy integration, no integrals. This is all trivial. This is the derivative is a constant. So just I to take the integral of this, but this anybody can do. And I have my solution. So everything is nice. Everything looks very simple. But remember that I gave you the F1. <laughs> if I didn't write that down, you know, probably the amount of work is conserved, right? It's related to some cyclic <laughs> variables. The amount of work to solve a problem is somehow conserved through all procedures. But of course, as you go on, you understand more about what is behind these, uh, these systems because you understand more mathematics, uh, the way they behave. You see, this is a nice way to solve the harmonic oscillator. And uh, it tells us something interesting. Well, actually, there is no systematic. That's unfortunately the problem. There is no systematic uh, way. You have to guess. But, uh, OK, but uh, yeah, I, I think I'll, at least I don't know. Of it. But there are some, uh, how to say, some aids, right, no? to, to, to do that. And uh, we will talk of some of them in a second. I just w wanted to decide what to, what, is, what to leave as an exercise and what to. Well, let me, let me introduce some more tools, and then we come back to these kind of problems. Um, I mean, the short answer to that is, is the fault. No, uh, the way I'm, I'm not answering right away is because I'm not sure I want to enter this, because the answer to your questions is the third way to solve problems in classical mechanics. I know, I mean, it never ends. Because there is a technique or a set of equations that are called Hamilton-Jacobi equations. Maybe you heard about those. I mean, some, in, you, you did, OK. Where? On, in what? On TV? <laughs> no. <laughs> in your class, of course. Uh, that exactly this. I mean, it's a set of differential equations 
that if you solve them, you find the generating function for the canonical transformation that bring the system in this very simple way. So that's the answer, that's the short answer. So usually I do that, uh, but I'm not sure we will have time. So, okay, let's see. Maybe Wednesday is the last lecture. Maybe we, you have the choice either. So usually I either uh, solve a simple problem using all possible techniques. So that's usually nice. It's a, it's a big hit. <laughs> or we discuss this Hamilton-Jacobi business. Of course, if I do the Hamilton-Jacobi, then I can solve that problem also using the Hamilton-Jacobi. So, well, let's see. Let's see how much we can <coughs> do uh, today. But, okay, that's the, the question. Of course, people ask themselves, okay, now I, I have this nice technique. How can I find this generating function? So there is no general way. The only general way is to solve these differential equations. Unfortunately, these differential equations are very complicated because they are differential equations with partial derivatives, okay? And those, they don't have general solutions. So for each case, probably you know, uh, there are classes, okay, okay, that, uh, we, if we do, we discuss that. Of course, it boils down to the following. So this is the takeaway message. <laughs> Those problems that admit an exact solution, they have an exact solution of the Hamilton-Jacobi, obviously, because then you, you, you will, f it's like this one. This clearly, I mean, you didn't need all this stuff because you knew that, you knew the solutions. But this way you learn something more, and this is the case. So if you do the Hamilton-Jacobi uh, uh, equation for the harmonic oscillator, the solution is this F1. So, I mean, it's not that I wake up one morning and I wrote that F1. You solve the Hamilton-Jacobi and you find that F1. Or you look it up in a, in a book or on the internet or whatever. So let's see how much we can... Uh, I mean, Hamilton-Jacobi, I mean, uh, usually students hate it. So I, uh, the f for a few years I was doing that. And then I stopped because they thought, well, I mean, it, it comes at the end. You know, everybody's tired. Why should we learn all this stuff? <laughs> but the point is that actually that would be the best way to introduce quantum mechanics because probably you, you've done that too, maybe. Because the, the Hamilton-Jacobi really is a smooth way to Schrodinger equation. And that's the way Schrodinger, uh, I mean, how Schrodinger came up with the Schrodinger equation through Hamilton-Jacobi essentially. No. Huh? Can we do it now? No, I mean, no, that I never do because that's really quantum mechanics. But if you know the Hamilton-Jacobi, you understand how to get the Schrodinger equation. Because usually Schrodinger equation, they, they write Schrodinger equation, they say, you know, this is the equation. Okay, but why? How, how did Schrodinger came up with that? Schrodinger knew classical mechanics and he knew Hamilton-Jacobi and it, it's, a, it's a nice path to do that. Uh, okay. He was a very, uh, he was a conservative guy. I mean, he, he, Heisenberg was a, really a revolutionary because he introduced this matrix stuff that really was never seen before. Uh, uh, you know, he really had the idea that you have jumps, so you have numbers. So you should write somehow the Fourier transform with matrices. So that was the Heisenberg approach. Schrodinger was more he liked classical mechanics, so he, he worked with this concept. And then they, 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 they show that, you know, these two approaches, right? Either you, you solve the Heisenberg matrices, you diagonalize matrices, you find eigenvalues, or you study the differential equation that is Schrodinger, you find the eigenvalues. So they, 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 they are equivalent, but conceptually they're very different, right? But people like very much Schrodinger equation because they knew about this stuff. So, you know, when you know something, you want to use the, what you know. You don't want to learn something new, like yourself. So people didn't want to know, you know, now I have to study the matrices. <laughs> so they say, no, I study the differential equations I know already. So that's only human. But the, this we cut. No lo mettiamo nel filmato questo. Okay, so what else do you need to study canonical transformation? So let me introduce another thing that, by the way, is related to quantum mechanics as well. These are called Poisson brackets. 
So I introduce those things because if you go uh, and study uh, more, you, you need to know what they are in order to, to. So this is just a handy way to see very often in this business, if you have two functions of your canonical variables, very often you end up taking this kind of derivatives. So this particular combination of derivatives. So Q, P, P, Q. Okay, so, okay. so U and V are functions of your canonical variables, Q, P, as many as the degrees of freedom. And very often, you, you will see, you end up having to compute this combination. First, you take the partial derivative with respect to Q of the first function, then the, the second function, and then the, the, the opposite. So this combination, Poisson decided, since he had to write this several times every day, he decided to call to, to uh, uh, the shorthand. So this is called the Poisson bracket. So if you see this symbol, it means this. So I guess I should write that. OK, so why, why bother? It is possible, but we are not going to prove that. It's possible to prove that they, they are invariant under canonical transformation. So it's a quantity that is invariant in form under canonical transformation. So it's interesting because if you compute this quantity, then it remains the same under canonical transformation. So, so uh, it may be useful. It may be not. Maybe we will see. Okay. And just by the definition, you see that uh, the Poisson brackets they uh, they uh, satisfy some, uh, some uh, easy, I mean, it's easy to prove, right, but just by inspection, that if you take the Poisson bracket of the same function, that vanishes, obvious. If u is equal to v, you have just written. And then they are, so, uh, so, and then they are anti-symmetric, you understand. If you take u Poisson bracket of v, this, you see, if you switch, if you switch V with U, you get the minus sign, right? So it's anti-symmetric. And also, uh, you have a linearity transformation. That is, if you take A U plus B V of another function W of your canonical transformation, then this, this thing is A U W plus B V W. So it's a sort of linear property. So they behave linearly under a linear transformation. Okay, that's maybe a little formal, but it, it may come useful. Now, why, why Poisson was getting these terms all the time? Well, it's easy to understand. Take a function, any function, of your canonical variables, so let's call it u, and take a, a total derivative, the same that we did uh, uh, half an hour ago, we took uh, F1, for instance, and I computed the total derivative. That we know how to do, the U, the uh, QI, Q dot I, right? U is a function of QI and PI, right? Of your canonical transformation, and maybe also T. Why not? Plus the U, the PI, P dot I. Uh, uh, of course, also du dt. So I wrote the total derivative of a function of q, p, and t in terms of the partial uh, of the partial uh, uh, derivatives, right? But now, now these are canonical variables. So this q dot is equal to what? Q dot, if you if you recall Hamilton equations, is the partial derivative of the h, right, with respect to p i. And p dot is minus the partial derivative of the h with respect to q i. So you see that uh, the total derivative of this function can be rewritten as du, dq i, dh, dpi, minus du, dpi, dh, dqi, that by definition, 
and now you understand why Poisson was getting all these Poisson brackets, is the Poisson bracket of your function and the Hamiltonian. Uh, you, you, uh, you, huh? Yeah, if, because you also have this, so plus d u d. You are right. So the total derivative of a function of your canonical variable can be written as the Poisson bracket with, with the Hamiltonian plus, as he pointed out, the, in case it depends explicitly on the Hamiltonian that. And also, you see what happens if this quantity happens to be a constant of motion that is conserved. Then, by definition, this, is, this vanishes. And therefore, a quantity that is a constant of motion, you have that this vanishes. Therefore, you have that for a constant of motion, the Poisson bracket is just equal to uh, 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 du dt. What happened to the minus sign? Very good. What happened to a constant of motion, a constant of motion, that does not depend explicitly on time, then this is gone. Therefore, a constant of motion that does not depend explicitly on time has Poisson bracket with the Hamiltonian vanishing. It commutes with the Hamiltonian, if this sounds more agreeable. So if so, in a way, this is a, another way you can discover constants of motions, right? You you check it has vanishing Poisson brackets. Is going to be it does not depend explicitly on time. That quantity is going to be a constant of motion. You, you studied the Dirac brackets in quantum mechanics, did you or did you not? The Dirac brackets, yes, no? Here, in, the, in George's class, yes? Y yes or no? no. Do, you, do you all take the same class? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> ah? What? Ah, second term, okay. Well, so that you will need this because Dirac's bracket, Dirac was another guy who la la loved this stuff. So the Dirac bracket are directly related to the Poisson bracket. So that's another reason why you need those. How about now, okay, here, now that I, I know about, so let me drop this uh, QP here. I mean, it's implicit that we are studying functions that are uh, with respect to canonical variables. Uh, you see immediately from the definition that if I take the Poisson bracket of the canonical variables themselves, so Qs and Ps, what happens? If I take a, a Poisson bracket of two, of two Pi, Pj canonical momenta, you see from here, right, what happens? They vanish. They, in fact, they are equal. Right? Because now, now u and v take p, p. So each time you, you have a missing, you know, so it vanishes. Same if you take q, q. The only case in which they do not vanish is if you take first a q and then a p, like this, pi, pj. And in fact, the only case in which you don't 
have a vanishes quantity if, if these two indices happen to be the same. And so back to the Kronecker, Kronecker index uh, tensor. So these are called Poisson fundamental brackets, I guess. Yeah. So uh, wait a second. You you want u to depend on, on t explicitly? Yeah, u depends on t. Yes. And t u by t is a constant. The, the partial derivative of u with respect t. Well, then um, it, it means that uh, it, it's a conserved quantity, right? Yeah, but u depends on t. No, but that's always true. U depends explicitly on t. That, that no, I mean, if u depends explicitly on t, this is true, right? And this is true. So that's all. What, what is the additional information you want to put in? Then you have that partial derivative that is not zero. Vanishes. And so we have uh, two uh, situations where u is a, a constant of the motion. No, it's a constant, so you want. So you want, wait a second. So you want this to be exactly equal to this with a minus sign in such a way that that goes to zero? No, I'm not sure I understood. Okay, let's, let's, uh, if so you want this equal to zero and this equal to zero? So then is this? No. no? Yeah. Both are distant from zero. Wait. They are equal. So d u d t equals the partial of u. Yes. That's all you want. Yes. That, well, then that implies that this is equal to that. Yeah, so if this is true, that means it only can be true if this is zero, right? Uh, I'm, uh, yes, because uh, look. I mean, this is only true if u depends only on t, right? Yeah. Yes, and then so we have two options for. So zero, zero. That means that this is zero too. Yeah. So we have two options, not only just one. So then so u. I know, uh, because, so you say, but this, th this is equal to this, but not equal to zero, right? Yes, yes. So that means that here you have that, uh, the, 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 well, clearly. Then h u is equal, zero. no, is equal to this. No, we say d u by dt is but So then you say this. Uh, okay. And then, uh, no, if this is true, but not equal to zero, then this is equal d u dt. It's just this case here. If this is equal to zero, then that's equal to zero. No? Yeah. Yeah. You think there is a third? Uh, I mean, uh, if we say t u by u t is the Poisson property plus the partial of u. No, but you, uh, the total derivative, equal partial derivative, is equal to zero or not? Not zero. Not zero. And, and OK, then this is true. And is also equal to the total derivative. So is, you're back here. Ah, then it means that the, ah, I see. You say then it means that the, the OK. Yeah, but this is OK, is what I said here. Right, because uh, this means that the, bra the Poisson bracket of h no, is equal to 0. So that it means that uh, it you cannot have this. So that's uh, <coughs> mm. 
So these are the fundamental Poisson, Poisson fundamental brackets. And now you understand you can also write Hamilton, Hamilton's equations using the Poisson bracket, right? Because you have, yes, other questions or it's just, uh, it's about this or something different? And then you, you can tell. If it's different, it's uh, your own business. But otherwise, we, we can hear about it. No, OK. You see that now I can write, yeah, let me finish because otherwise. I can write, you see, use this, uh, you see, this, this, uh, this is dh, dpi, right? is equal to q dot i. So you see, this is a, I'm writing the Hamilton equations, and I can write also the other one, pi h minus dh dqi equal p dot i. So for the canonical ensemble, you have a very First of all, canonical variables satisfy this, uh, the, the, they, they commute or whatever, they have br Poisson brackets vanishing if you, among themselves, and then you have this nice relation that uh, only the conjugate momentum has a non-vanishing Poisson bracket with the corresponding coordinate. Moreover, you can easily, you know, just plug in Q and IH here, and you get the Hamilton equation for the case. So Hamilton equations can be written as the partial derivative of h with respect to pi equal to the Poisson bracket of the canonical co the coordinate with respect to h. And, vice, uh, and the same for, for the other canonical, canonical variables. Sir? Yes. That preserves the, can the Poisson bracket is canonical, exactly. So the converse is also true. Yes, in fact, this is a way to check. In fact, this is part of the exercises that I'm trying to decide whether. So let me give you, then we stop. Uh, in fact, this is, uh, so now I, I wrote this stuff with the Poisson bracket. So now, uh, so if I now give you a canonical transformation, if I give you a canonical transformation, for instance, let me give you this. This is a homework we see. Uh, uh, maybe on Monday. I, I, so take this one. I think it's problem four or chapter nine of the Goldstein. But anyway, I write it for you. Right? I mean, this is a transformation from little q and little p, q, p, q, p, to big q and big p. Imagine that you have a problem, and then you, you have discovered that if you do this transformation, the problem goes into a trivial one with a, with a constant Hamiltonian. Yeah? So you are now very eager to prove that you can do that. Uh, 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 so is it? Canonical. And I guess the other problem with the same question, is it canonical? This is problem 15 of chapter 9. So this is problem 4. So uh, I don't know, 19, no, it's 9, 4. This is 9, 15. Another set, big Q. Q alpha 
where alpha is a constant, cosine beta p, a big P, is equal to Q alpha sine beta little p. So this is another, uh, the same question. And you see that now you have uh, at least two ways to, to prove that, because one way is, for instance, take uh, for the first one, try the first way. What is the definition, you remember, it was written here of a canonical transformation. A canonical transformation is a transformation for which the Hamilton equations are preserved in form. So you have to prove that by doing this transformation, right, your equations with the new Hamiltonian k, big K, are the same form as the, the canonical one. Okay, this is one way. You can try that here. And, but as he pointed out, because of the, uh, if, your, uh, if your new variables satisfy these three equations, by definition they are canonical. So if you, impl you, you compute this for the new variables, and if they satisfy that, you are guaranteed that you have transformed to a new set of variables that are still canonical. So try to write the Hamiltonian and, and check that the, 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 the Hamilton equation are preserved in this first case. And in the second case, implement the Poisson bracket, the canonical Poisson, the fundamental Poisson bracket, and verify that if they, are, if they are satisfied for little q and little p, they are also satisfied. This is what you, you, you wanted. And of course, they are not going to be satisfied for any values of alpha and beta. So you will find some condition. They are satisfied only if alpha is equal to beta is equal to some values. So on Monday, we will solve those two get together. Uh, if, if you, uh, Ah, yeah. If you feel particularly, well, if you have nothing better to do, after you have proved for which values of alpha and beta these are canonical, then you may wonder what is the generating function of this canonical transformation. And I tell you that is of the form F3. And, uh, okay, I, I challenge you to find how do you find an F? Clearly, you have to mix your coordinates. You see, here is the opposite problem. Usually, you have the F, and, you f and then, by using the equations we discussed today, you find the canonical transformation. Here, you have the canonical transformation. So what is the F that generates that canonical transformation? Well, you have to mix your, your variables and, and then guess the function. We, we will do it on, on Monday.